That'll line it up. I'm here for that. Okay. Five Stripe Final, J. Sam Jones from the Mothership and Dirty South Soccer. Joe Patrick from Nights Point on the Game and Dirty South Soccer is over there. Joe Patrick, the newly introed Five Stripe Final. The song is Chances from Kurt Castle. Off his record, if I'm here at all, you can go check that on Spotify, Bandcamp, Kurt's all over the place. He also, Joe Patrick, happens to be a listener. I love Kurt. Kurt's always, he's like the, um, when when there's, like, your life is turbulent and you feel bad about yourself kurt is always there for you honestly he's a great guy uh and thank you so much for letting us use your song in our new intro which i think now has an atlanta united player in it i, I think at least one i think i, I think it's literally one i think it's just joseph <laughs> but he's the, he's the only one we can reliably we can depend on he will always be there for our mm -hmm. intro yeah but but it includes the legends i think that's like an evergreen thing like if Absolutely. you were ever, like if you were buying a jersey of any of these players everyone would go okay yeah i understand that's a parker's jersey and that's an almron jersey and that's a lorenowitz jersey and everyone would be okay with that for for the foreseeable <laughs> future you know um, you know so it's, it's, it's not like there were any great goal calls like what goal calls could we have used from this last year like we can't use uh they're Did all gone score? too you know yeah john gallagher not here adam john not here <laughs> <laughs> trying to think who else may have scored a goal yeah so adam john did score the best goal of the year didn't he against orlando um yes that's the, yes he did that is that the forehead. best moment of the that, year that probably, i guess oh that's a good question what was the best oh. moment from okay no it was uh um, it, may have it been was that. marco's goal against uh nashville ah uh, yeah yeah i think that was the best moment Gosh. and we were See, all that so young and full of life i know it doesn't really coming up on a year it doesn't even feel like the same season that that happened that's just so crazy you forget about those those two games Absolutely. No, it's almost a year to the day. Uh, yeah. About, I think next weekend, maybe two weekends from now is when that game would have gone down. So that's, it's, it's wild to think about. Have wild I ever, have I ever told the story of that national game on this podcast of like my experience with of old, you being with coronavirus on, on the bus? <laughs> and I was like, Joe, it's not even a big deal. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell the story. The so, so for 92.9 the game the, the club got in touch with you know i obviously work for 92.9 i kind of am like a reporter for them sort of like I, i'll do some you know <laughs> I'll, I'll fill in on radio hits like talking a little bit of atlanta united even though jason longshore is kind of their main guy for that um but you know they asked to put me on a supporters bus that was tr that was taking you know a couple supporters buses taking like 50 or so people in each one up to the stadium uh nissan stadium i guess it is in nashville and the night before you know we'd heard a little bit of coronavirus news um you know that it was happening mainly in china you know they didn't know what it was and then the night before that trip there was like this like cnn report i will never forget it it was um uh i forget her name not i want to say aaron andrews what's the uh she has like a nightly show female anchor um anyway she was doing a she was doing a news report on coronavirus and it was terrifying like probably i i would argue more terrifying than coronaviruses end up being even though it's been absolutely terrible it was like putting this picture in your head of the absolute end times type of thing and <laughs> so the last thing you want to see before you get on a bus with 50 other people four hours each way and so um, I almost was like considering not backing out completely, but just like, Hey, can I like drive myself up there? But, uh, <laughs> ended up doing it and it was fine. And I'll never forget like being in the, in Nissan stadium, I went to the bathroom and there's like some dude in there who's like, everybody wash your hands, coronavirus. And like, and people are like laughing. <laughs> You're all so young. And, uh, yeah. Wow. So and then I, so I'm, by the way, I'm terrified of like riding in the bus or whatever. And then I have a couple of beers in the tailgate because I was just going there once I was at the game, you know, I was off the clock essentially. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple of beers at the game and then like some drunk Atlanta United fan comes by. He's like, got moonshine here. And I'm like drinking out of the bottle after like 50 <laughs> other people have drank it. So I was like, yeah, all inhibitions gone. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, what, what, a, what a great time to, to look back and appreciate everything. But Joe Patrick, we're going to, we're going to look forward from here on out. You know why? Because it's, business time. Business time, starting off, it's just the news. Don't let us fool you with our segment names. Uh, first things first, we have to officially 
say goodbye to Eric Rometty. Officially makes a move to the San Jose Earthquakes who traded for him for, depending on who you ask, a decent amount of GAM or just a shit ton of GAM. Uh, Lady United seems to be in the latter category. It's a 200,000 GAM move. Uh, depending on performance incentives, those can go all the way up to make it a 500,000 GAM move, move. And my understanding is that the incentives are reachable, yes? I think so. I mean, it's it's, it's tough when – if you if it was a striker, you may think like, oh, the incentives are probably like goals or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think if if the incentives are like San Jose has to like win MLS Cup for, for you know, these incentives <laughs> to hit, then that would be different. And that was – I think like Nagby had these similar kind of incentives, and <laughs> I think like all of them hit because Atlanta United won MLS Cup literally the year he came. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that's what the incentives are going to be like. I would think that the incentives – are going to be pretty basic for like a defensive midfielder. It's not like you can judge somebody on like the amount mm -hmm. of goals they scored or something like that. So it's one probably of the has something to do with like, where like not being able to quantify players comes to an advantage for us, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just because he, you know, you can't really say anything too much about anything he does. His except... goal plus rating needs to be right. above <laughs> 0 0.5. Negative 1.4, <laughs> which it wasn't last year. Yeah. I'm going to keep but, uh, doing that. Up to uh, 500K. So that I think it's a great return. I, I want to ask you, what do you think is better? Because the other deal that was reportedly on the table mm -hmm. was going to Independiente for $120,000 on a loan fee with a potential $1 million purchase option. Let's just say that the purchase option would have brought the total to $1 million just to be safe. Um, so it would have been like 800 and whatever. Which one would... I think that the Remedy deal is better, even though... Because you don't know that that loan option is going to be picked up. Mm -hmm. um or the the you know the buy option i should say is going to be going to be picked up and i think that garber bucks aka gam or tam is like more valuable i think to atlanta united at this point i don't know what you think no you're exactly right it's more valuable at this point there's just certain inherent things that kind of come with the the cap structure and everything like that that, that make them a better a better value it, it's kind of that simple i um, mean you look at a loan for for a player like Ernetti, and the danger there is you end up with a player who maybe got hurt, maybe didn't pan out, anything like that. This is a little more final, and it's a step in the yeah. right direction. Unlike, it, I mean, when you talk about getting hurt, you know, Franco Escobar just broke this morning. Just that broke he his got, foot. He got hurt. Yeah, he's got yeah. a broken foot, it sounds like, and he could be out for a while. So mm -hmm. that will be interesting, and I wonder if that changes anything um, because he's on a loan deal, technically. So mm -hmm. does that mean that, you know, Newell's might be less uh, inclined to – pick him up full time um, after the loan. Who knows? My thing about that is it is, it's a bone injury. It's that fifth metatarsal. Think about the middle bone in your pinky foot, pinky toe. Um, it sounds like it hurt like hell. That's what it looks like first off, but it's also a two month recovery process. My understanding is that loan is for the year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he, he will be recovered by that point. It's not a muscle injury. It's not going to affect him exactly the same way. Okay. So I, I think he will be able to, to get back in there and maybe be able to prove himself, but still it, it, it just kind of shows to go, goes to show you how fleeting some of that stuff is, you know? And, and, and so there's no risk with what we've done here with Remedy. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And, and even I think if, even if Joe Patrick, he does pan out and, and somehow Matias Ameda reshapes him. He turns him into this great player inside his system. He was never going to be that at Atlanta United. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. He was yeah, never you're, you're going right. to be that at Atlanta United. So there is no risk to doing this move. And, and both of these moves come back to, you're just trying to give yourself more flexibility in the transfer market, you know, even in just like mm -hmm. within the, the MLS market specifically with, when it comes to receiving gam and things like that. So, um, you know, both these players, I think, tie into the same kind of theme where Atlanta United just needs to kind of give themselves some maneuverability. And so anybody you can get value for, you know, I think you strongly consider it. Something that was pointed out to me that I thought was really interesting and something I really didn't remember is we have the reported transfer fee for Remedi at around $2 million. Do you remember that? Really? Yeah, it was a chunk of change for, for a player who played pretty okay in mm -hmm. 2018. Not amazing, but pretty okay. Could do a job for sure. For sure. And then kind of fell off a cliff a little bit. Uh, that, that might be on Frank. That might be on him. Who knows? But that I, was a chunk, man. I, yeah, I do want to say, uh, like, uh, we've 
you know, criticized Eric Rometty for poor performance. I think he would criticize himself um, for the form he's had. I, you know, he was valuable and he did a good job. And I think that the thing was that Tata Martino had a very clear role for him, very simple mm -hmm. instructions. And I think that honestly, he couldn't get back to that in San Jose with Matias Almeida, like the man marking system, I think suits Eric Rometty really well. Uh, obviously he's, they have experience with each other. So Matias Almeida knows what he's getting um, from having had Eric Rometty at Banfield. And I think that, you know, one of the things we kind of heard in the aftermath of the Frank DeBoer era was that, he, that there just was not enough instruction for anybody. Like there was just yeah, not no enough, doing. yeah, That's there was just not enough tactical. Right. Exactly. So I don't want it to seem like we're like, um, you know, just crapping on him, just a crap on him. I think that the circumstances in Atlanta made it more difficult for a player like him. And so it just makes sense to make this move at this point. The only thing that interests me the most is his legs. I don't know if he has the legs to keep up in that kind of system. It's yeah. going to be super interesting. He's always been a stocky kind of dude mm -hmm. and he's never been particularly fast. He's never been a guy who's going to put in like a Nico Adero style shift running around in midfield. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how he kind of works with Jackson Yule and others in San Jose. But it, it gives me one more reason to watch San Jose, which I'm kind of here for. I always love to, to watch them. They're my favorite maybe second favorite non-Philadelphia, non-Atlanta MLS team. I mean, you just know when you tune into a San Jose match, you're going to see something interesting. You don't know how it's going to yeah. go, and that's one of the funnest things about it. Exactly, exactly. So Eric joins the chaos a little more. Uh, Atlanta gets a hefty chunk of money back for him, fake money, but still money. And we move on, and, and we see what happens next with our new midfielder, Santiago Sosa, announced officially this week. Last yep. week. When was it? Friday? Yeah, I think it was, it was Friday. Friday. Yeah. I, I don't know if we have that much to add. There was nothing really, you know, revealed with the with the reveal. Um, <laughs> but nice to see his face, you know, nice to see him uh, actually in the colors. That's always kind of a, a unique mm -hmm. feeling. Kind of like mm -hmm. the same with Gabriel Einze. Like first time I would like to, I would like to make a, stuff. Exactly. I would like to make a clarifying point, though. He does not have Bama Banks. Those are not oh, okay. Bama Banks. Okay. Bama Banks come dangerously close to covering both eyebrows you can have the one like kind of swoop down a little bit you can have it long in the front you know but as long as you're not as long as you're leaving an eyebrow open for the lord to see <laughs> those aren't bama banks yeah he this has yeah, been <laughs> it's kind of like a little bit too curly too to be bama bangs i feel like bama bangs yeah are like it's the, the hair is very straight yeah uh -huh. it's just like a straight swoop mm -hmm. across <laughs> That was, that, was, that was a PSA that we put together for y'all. Y'all are welcome. Um, other moves going on as well as we see another player maybe about to head out from Atlanta United Rana Mesa reportedly offered to go on loan to San Lorenzo. And it kind of seems likely to happen. It kind of seems like he has one foot out the door. It feels very similar to how the Remedi stuff went down. It came quickly and then all of a sudden it just seemed like a done deal. Yeah, I think the most interesting part of this Fernando Meza report is kind of what it signifies or like what it means. The fact that they are, the report is that Atlanta United has offered him on loan to San Lorenzo. So um, regardless of what it means about what they, you know, in terms of the scouting and whether they think he's like a capable squad member, I just think it's interesting that it pretty clearly means that this team is still in the market for a center back, which is something that we'll address later when we get to the listener questions because I know people were kind of asking about that. Um, but if they sell Meza, the the center back position, you have Miles Robinson, Anton Campbell. Walks. Walks. Yeah, the, rook, the rookie um, that they signed, mm -hmm. Bauer. Or they haven't even signed Bauer, I should say. Um, I don't think he's going to be in the picture. He might be in the picture for the twos. I'm sure he will be. But, you know, there's not proven MLS depth there, really. So uh, they – clearly will be in that market uh, and we know they are based on the push that they made for uh, Martinez so it'll be interesting to see what they do and maybe the reason that this deal has not gone final is because that Martinez deal kind of fell apart um, mm. so it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with Fernando Meza somebody got in touch with me last week saying that there was pictures of him running and he was still in Argentina um, recently as of like a week ago or so um atlanta united players are supposed to report on february 24th for like a quarantine period so mm. we'll see we'll see uh what happens with him worth keeping uh an eye on his instagram i guess 
<laughs> yeah, we do want to make note, by the way, of a, a new start date for training. I think we talked multiple times yeah. last show about how we were definitely starting on time and everything like that. And I think like a day later, they came out and said, actually, season's pushed back. <laughs> Uh, season will officially begin on April 17th. Training doesn't really change, though, for Atlanta United, considering that CCL starts on April 6th, I believe. So training will technically officially begin on February 24th, where Atlanta United players cannot join training until they have undergone a seven-day quarantine period. Now, you can volunteer by yourself to go ahead and get that quarantine period out of the way before you come to Atlanta. Uh, however, uh, if you don't do that, you have to wait till March 1st, essentially, is what it means. So uh, training will start in full on March 1st. So we'll get a better idea, hopefully, then. But some players could theoretically start training before then, like in small yes. groups. And that, okay. That's exactly right. That's exactly that right. So it's kind of a mess, but we'll, we'll know hopefully a little more then. Uh, the weird thing about that is we can't be at training. We can't tell you who's there <laughs> yeah. and who's not there. They probably won't tell us who's there and not there. So we may have no idea on, on Mesa going forward, but we do know that there's a lot of work to be done at center back. Like we said, it, it's Robinson, it's George Campbell, it's Anton Walks, and no one else right now. Yep. That's, that's, that's a huge hole. It's kind of scary. It is. It is. Maybe, I mean, Sosa, I and guess you could, those guys you could are say bad. Sosa could fill in there, but yeah. Yeah. Sosa can fill in there. That, that's true. We do know that, but that does not seem to be his primary purpose. And I hope it's not his primary purpose. Yeah, he certainly he's he's not playing center back in a back two or back four. I don't think mm -hmm. so. We'll see. We'll see. Lots to figure out there. Oh um, man, that's it's uh, interesting. It's it's, it's, a, it's an active market. It's, it's a you it know is. there's still a lot to do. You know these things uh, kind of come down to the wire. So it'll be fun. That is not a move that I think we're going to wait till summer to to find out about that. That is something that will happen yeah. almost assuredly before the season starts. Whether that's like a week before or. Right when training starts, we don't know yet, but it's something to keep an eye on. You know, some for sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll address that in the when we talk about it more specifically in the questions. <clears throat> something else to keep an eye on: Darwin Mathias, a winger, nineteen-year-old from Venezuela. Did you just call him Mathias? Matthias? Darwin Matthias? <laughs> I, mean, I think what it's like Ma Matthias. Like Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> ain't my fault. I'm from Rinkin, Georgia. <laughs> God damn it. Shit. Anyway, Joe Darwin Matthias. Come on, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm not <laughs> a little I'm bit of culture. Matthias. No. Oh was my it? gosh, that was like Gorlami. What was that? <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> a kid, a 19 year old winger Something from Venezuela, cool, played yeah. for Zamora FC. Um, same agent as Joseph Martinez, from my understanding, which is kind of how Chris Smith, our very own got around to sorting uh, to, to helping break the story as it kind of broke uh, last that week. agent by the way he's like the powerhouse agent in venezuela he's the guy who kind of represents almost all of the <laughs> venezuelan mm -hmm. national team so probably a good sign that just the fact that he's signed with that agency means that he probably has some prospects but mm -hmm. what i'm hearing is that he'll probably be a, a twos player I, I don't know that for sure i don't know if the plan will be to sign him to a on, to the first team but have him play mostly for the twos but it sounds like that's kind of the level he's at which is understandable i mean he's coming from zamora fc uh, you know mm -hmm. a, a small smaller club in in venezuela so but the reports seem like good um chris smith and his report for dirty south soccer talked to a local journalist down there and uh who has seen mateus play in person and seems like a good you know prospect you take a shot on Kind of similar it reminds me of the Jose Hernandez uh signing that they signed that the sure, yeah. Atlanta United signed a couple years ago. He didn't pan out, but you know, with these players, of course, they're like lotto tickets, you know. You just try to it's like prospecting. You just try to <laughs> you you sign a bunch and if a few of them hit, that probably turns out pretty well for you. So exactly, exactly. I got I got excited at first, I'll admit, to seeing a winger come on the radar. I still think that's a big area need. Definitely. Yep. Which we'll talk about a million times, I'm sure, before yeah. the season, during the season, after we don't make the playoffs, things like that, you know. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, but Darwin uh, should come in and, and maybe eventually have an impact. He's very tiny. He's a little guy. He reminds me of Michael Berrios is the first guy I thought of. He's like mm -hmm. a sneaky, good mm -hmm. winger for Dallas. He's very, 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 very hot and cold, but can still make things happen. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. My understanding he doesn't have a whole lot of end product right now, but you, you can grow into that somewhat as you get older, for sure. For sure. Uh, if he does make an impact at the beginning of the year, he'll do it 
potentially, again, if he makes the team, in a tough draw, Joe Patrick, it's a tough draw. It's a tough draw in CCL. I, I just want everyone to know how tough sure. it is. It's a <laughs> tough one. Um, I'm not even going to try to say, Joe, you say the name. Who is the team we've drawn here from Costa Rica? Alahuelense. I think Alahuelense. Matthews. I I think stuff just started floating behind Joe Patrick. It's like a a Harry Potter spell. Anyway, tough draw, tough draw. Um, Look, look, this is, this is my whole thing with CCL every single year. Some team is going to draw a team that's not a Liga MX team and everyone's going to talk about how tough a draw it is. Mm. You know why? Because it's the champions league because they're all tough draws every single one of them they all did because well the, in their league yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly so so look except for atlanta united <laughs> except for atlanta united which is hysterical they must, the yellow ones it must be like yeah what oh, easy draw. We got the team yeah. <laughs> <laughs> incredible incredible but don't you dare disrespect the 2019 us open cup champions atlanta right. united how dare you um yeah no look the uh, people aren't paying attention to this team every other week that can only really rely on form and everything like that. There's always going to be that like one random dude that everyone recognizes and goes, Oh, you gotta, you gotta look out for, for this guy. And in this case, it's Brian Ruiz who's been on the Costa Rican national team for forever and ever and ever. Um, how does that translate to playing against Atlanta United? I don't know. They don't know. <laughs> no one knows. Look, it's going to be hard. They're a good team. I think they've, they, they haven't won 16 games on the trot, but they have not lost in 16 games. That won't matter probably in, in two months whenever this goes down, but they have the ability to go on runs like that. Uh, they won the CONCACAF League to get into this competition. They are, they're good. They're going to be CONCACAF-y. It's going to be messy. The Lady United is going to have a big task ahead of them as they have every single year in the first round. I have a question, um, which I should definitely know but I had, but I don't know. So I'm going to ask you: is, is the team traveling to the locations to the like traveling across borders for this tournament? They're not doing a central location. I you don't know either. Is, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know okay. for sure. So but I'm just my curious. understanding is yes. I'm they just curious because that definitely else. makes it more difficult. Uh, I would assume they would try to do that, um, mm-hmm. and that definitely makes it difficult. That's why, like, that's just why this tournament's tough because you have to go play in various locations that you're just not accustomed to i I would give you know if if it were like a central location type of thing i would give i would say it's a much easier draw for atlanta united but um exactly one thing i can say about this tie is that the game will be played april 6th through 8th sometime in that time span (laughs) that's good that's good and one thing you have to remember too is that there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes on too i I talked to steve zakuani about this a while back Uh, the former sounders player now does some stuff for mls uh, does a lot of analysis for for seattle uh, now as their color guy, but he was talking about going down for a CCL game and how they would like get to the locker room and it would be locked. They would have to go get someone to like unlock (laughs) the thing or they would go to the training pitch and it would be locked or maybe they ran the sprinklers all night and it was just kind of flooded and stuff like that. There's all sorts of little things that happen when you go down to a place that wants to make it difficult, uh, that, that makes it difficult, you know? So it it just, it's always going to be tough. Look, I, I just need y'all to know that it's going to be tough, tough draw, tough draw. Yep. I, I don't really have anything else to say about it, but it'll be interesting. I mean, it, it's also going to be tough because it's going to be Atlanta's first game. It's going to be their first competitive match of this season. So it's mm-hmm. always difficult to kind of get yourself ramped up. And I think that this, that Ella, well, well yes. see, I made the mistake of trying to say their name. <laughs> uh, anyway, they, that team, Atlanta's opponent will have played, I think, like nine or ten league games at that point. So um, that's all, and that's always going to be the case with MLS as long as Champions League remains on the schedule. And mm-hmm. I think it's a fair hurdle that MLS teams have to surpass. Like I think it's a it's a challenge, and it's going to hurt mm-hmm. MLS teams in terms of having to actually win the tournament against these Mexican clubs. But mm-hmm. I embrace the challenge of that. You know, I think it's good. I think it's good to not make it as comfortable as possible for these teams to uh, have success in the tournament. So. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, it's the thing that'll keep pushing MLS teams yeah. to, uh, to get bigger and bigger and everything like that. Maybe spend a little money as they can, maybe expand those rights, et cetera, et cetera. The good news besides the draw, which I think out of all the things considered, you could have, you could have drawn Club Leon from Mexico and that would have been just an absolute bear. They won the Apertura 
down there uh, during the fall season. Um, that would have been tough. That would have been tough in the first round. We fortunately avoided that uh, in the second round. It's not as bad as it could be. It's either going to be Philadelphia or Deportiva Saprissa, uh, both good teams. Uh, Philly is kind of on a, a, a turnover transition kind of year as they lose a couple of big players. Saprissa always good. <laughs> Same as every other team <laughs> in the league. I'm going to keep harping on that. But uh, the worst thing that you probably have to face here if you do continue to advance is probably Club America. But yeah, at that point, you have a semifinal with Club America, and then you have whatever – probably the yeah, next team is waiting on, on the other side in the final, if you keep advancing. So all things considered, that's about as easy as a draw as you could have possibly hoped for. Word. There you go. There you go. I, I don't think they have a chance. I'm going to be real. <laughs> this team, it would be shocking if they did shocking, yeah. but Hey, weird things have happened because of trying to put that team together. It's going to be so much more difficult um, as opposed to being like a Philadelphia union team where you have like really good kind of, you're bringing a solid core back. You got a lot yes. of cohesion with the tactics and all that stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll, we'll just have to see. But I think that's everything we have for business time. Chip Patrick, get the questions after a quick break. Another stunning break. Another one. Just incredible. I, I truly, I felt something. I really did. I really did. Did we talk about Lucid in that break? Oh, yeah, for sure. Sweet. I love it. I, I, Lucid's putting out some good stuff, man. I, I, we follow them. I know. They're, they're one of the, the six people we follow on the Five Stripe final account, the other being five Stripe related things, which I thought was a great bit at the time. I still think it's a pretty good bit. <laughs> yeah, they're the only good. one we follow. Solid. So their, their stuff pops up every time I check the Five Stripe final account. They, 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 the new stuff is cool, man. It looks yeah. really cool. I like the sweatshirts a lot. It's a good look. It's a good look. Y'all go check it out. They sent me a, uh, they, they send talking points every once in a while for us to discuss when we're on the show. And uh, mm -hmm. I, after when I saw that they had a new line come out, I went and checked out their website it's at lucidfc.us. And uh, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. I need to get more free stuff from them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, same. Same. Speaking of looking good though, Atlanta United has some questions about that uh, because Joe Patrick, there have been leaks of the new, primary kit there have yes. not yet been any leaks of the new third kit remember atlanta being the only team to acquire a third kit this season but the response to the leaks of the new primary have been less than positive mm -hmm. i don't well, know if y'all have seen it yet uh, it's a it looks like a, a black based jersey it's got red piping on the collar and the sleeves and then instead of the, the usual stripes look that we've kind of grown used to, it's very reminiscent of Ace and Milan, Metro Stars and things like that. Instead, it's that black base with three or five tiny red lines going down the center of the shirt. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to put out my opinion on it first because I'm actually more in the positive camp. Like, I think it's fine. I am not like a, a fashion person, as I've said many times. If, you, if you've listened to this show and talking <laughs> when, I, when we talk about Lucid FC, I always say that like the best thing about their clothes is that they make me look good because I don't know what to wear and I just generally don't have a sense of fashion. So like to me, the kit looks fine it looks kind of you know it's pretty black <laughs> but um like you know it's, it's like mostly black except for the the five red stripes or lines or whatever going down the middle but there's nothing to me that sticks out as being like massively terrible about it I would in fact my main issue with it is the the neck like the collar how the collar comes together at the neck mm -hmm. it's like this like gap area and then it kind of like gets cut down kind of low so but but I, it seems like most people's issue is with the stripage um and so i guess that's just my perspective on it um but i know that you have a lot more kind of insight into like how these things get put together and how they come together because you wrote about this uh, for mlssoccer.com so i was just kind of i wanted to just kind of get your insight into that whole process and then um i know that you kind of just think differently about it I love the way you described that collar because it sounded to me like a V-neck shirt that isn't brave enough to be itself. Exactly. Like it's what just it self-conscious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's just tops. Like, we're going V. Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> 
Um, I, the, the tip, I, I don't mind that collar design at all, um, frankly. Uh, but, but I did want to That's because you're bit. in shape. That's true. <laughs> um, Joe, you look great. Don't don't lie. You can see Joe on, on YouTube. We're recording these on YouTube. Yeah. By the way, if you're wanting to get a look at us. Yeah, but look at this collar, this. though. See, you got you to uh, it's it way up. Uh, it's way, way too high. That's my, my style. Be confident, Joe. Um, look, I want to offer some insight into the process um, as a whole. Um, I, I did get some insight when I, I've done a couple stories on this. I did the story recently, like I mentioned, on, on Philadelphia's new fan design jersey. Um, it's where I want to kind of stay because I don't think I can offer too many opinions on on the kit without coming off as antagonistic. See, in a way, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want you to feel like uh, you can't share an opinion about this because you're being <laughs> a bad guy or something. And, sure. And, yeah. Sure. Um, look here, I have a song. I have a song that's going to think, I think it's really going to sum up how this kind of works. All right. If your team's kid is boring, it's their fault. If your team's kid is boring, it's their fault. If your team's kid is boring and it leaves the people snoring, if your team's kid is boring, it's their fault. That was good. There, thank you. I thought of that. No joke on in my pre-show restroom break. Um, so look, there is a process that goes through and it's very vague to, to kind of put it lightly. So essentially how the Adidas kits work is they will go to a team and a team will come back to them after they've been handed what's essentially a brief, right? It's a short one page kind of deal that you can fill out as a team, as a club. And you send that back to Adidas. And what it ends up being essentially is a kit mood board. If you don't know mood board is just kind of search mood board. It's, it's kind of like someone will post like angry and someone will put together a collage of like red and like frowny faces mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so you're essentially sending that off to Adidas in that one page kind of brief. So what Philadelphia did, if you if you looked at their kind of kit, they said, one, we don't want it white. So if it's white, it's your team's fault. Um, so they, they put out a color that was this light blue and light yellow that's uh, synonymous with Philadelphia, synonymous with that kind of tri-state area with Delaware and everything like that. It's the Philadelphia flag, everything like that. They wanted something with that. They looked at other um, iconography associated with Philadelphia. They settled on um, lightning and key and excited kite. It's very Ben Franklin oriented, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that all happened in a big group of fans they called the, the Creators Collective up there in Philadelphia. So they took the big step of bringing those fans into the process and letting them design their own stuff. They, they basically said, here is how it works. Here's how we've done it in the past. Adidas gets back to us with three designs, essentially, and we kind of have to choose from them, right? Um, so what we can do is make sure that there are certain elements involved, and that's really it, mm -hmm. right? So they send that brief off, and about, <laughs> they literally phrase it to me as 60 to 90 days, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, it's very, like, businessy, I guess. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they go through the design process and they will essentially send you back three templates. I think in this case, it was four. And that was four because like two of the templates were inverted on the colors, right? Um, so mm -hmm. at that point, that collective reconvened to look at the options um, and, and chose the one that they thought represented the team best. And they ended up with this light blue, light yellow uh, lightning design, which is very unique. And I think looks great mm -hmm. the more I look at it for sure. So, for sure. so ostensibly Atlanta United would have sent in a brief. Yes. And I can probably imagine what they would have put on that brief, which is probably five stripes. They would have said, mm -hmm. we need some sort of five stripe thing. And I would imagine that Atlanta United, just knowing this brand that we're all kind of familiar with at this point, they would have said things like, you know, big club or like things that kind of, um, things that probably aren't as, uh, out there creative um like you would see from a team like the philadelphia union because atlanta united has built its brand around being this kind of global in the circle of these you know huge european clubs mm -hmm. and so that's probably where this kind of came out of that, now, that's probably why there's this more simple less kind of flamboyant um design 
something to remember that I think is very, very key to understanding how we ended up here is that this is a two year process. It's a two year ah. process. So the headspace that Atlanta United was in at that point and the kit we've ended up with, in my opinion, very much reflect the headspace the team was kind of in heading towards the DeBoer era. And that's why I have thoughts on it. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you know, because it, you're right. It's a big club. It feels like a, a team that like a PSG that looked at their, their normal identity and went, how can we make that different? How can mm-hmm. we make it more fashion forward? Things like that. Um, with maybe throwing the, the identity and brand that the, the people have kind of come attached to throwing that in the back and maybe not pushing for it as much. Mm-hmm. So on, on that brief, Joe, I think you're right. I think they probably said something like we want the stripes, right? We want maybe five, however you want to do it. It ends up, it ends up not being <laughs> that if you really look at it. Yeah. Um, and we want a black base is probably my thought. Yeah, probably. Yeah. People have kind of called true. for that as well. You mm-hmm. know, if you just inverted the five stripes of the black base, you know, you would have something different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and so one of the templates I'm sure Adidas came back with was this, um, it may have been the best one, frankly. Yeah. You know, um, but you know, if teams like Philadelphia, teams like LA and all these other very solid kits that are coming out that have some originality to them um, and really still stick with the, the team identity have, have shown that if you are involved in a way that is fan forward, that is fan centric, and, you know, Philadelphia obviously went the extra mile here. You can make something that is going to be well-liked and well-received and still builds on the brand identity that you've built. Because when you get away from an identity that everyone kind of agrees is positive, that everyone kind of agrees is attached to the team, you get away from what makes the communities that make these teams possible, in my opinion, right? Mm-hmm. So when you don't understand that, when you don't come across as listening, it can be frustrating. Yeah. It can be difficult for fans to kind of recognize and that might reflect in the jersey sales, honestly. It might. We'll see. We'll see. You know, I, I'm not convinced of that because obviously Atlanta United will outsell just about every team, mm-hmm. you know, at this point. It's just, it's just how it is. But they may not outsell them as much. You know, I was thinking about your song and, you know, it's kind of funny because like, I like boring clothes. Like that's like the, the clothes <laughs> I wear are like meant to be boring. I wear lots of like sure. black and gray and just like muted, like not extravagant colors and stuff like that so um that's probably one of the reasons why i like just i don't mind it or in fact i kind of like it like i think it looks fine we should also point out that we haven't seen the actual you know we've seen this the uh, replicas and not the authentics which will have like mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> a piedmont badge or something <laughs> on the side i don't know how much of a difference it'll make but um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to talk about it because I know people feel all kinds of different ways. And I don't want, I never want us to feel like we need to come across on something as being like um, always like positive or supportive or, or, or the other way or <laughs> constantly sure. like negative. I think it's very yeah. healthy for us to just like, if we have different opinions on something, we should definitely share it. So mm-hmm. that's why I wanted to discuss. And I'm sure that yeah, no, you're, you're we'll totally have some right. people who kind of like it and some people who don't. And I think you're totally awesome. right. And here's my thing. Like it's, I, I keep kind of coming back to that creativity thing and it's not necessarily even that it's uncreative. It's just something that I think would have worked much better as, as the third kit, as something mm, unique, yeah. as something different, you know, but when you're coming with your primary kit, when you're coming with the one that's supposed to represent you as an identity, that's become synonymous essentially with the city at this point, with the team that won with everything like that. And you, you kind of throw that aside. I think you missed the mark. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's all that all the kit talk. I'm sure people can handle. I would just add one thing <laughs> about the third kit, which is that we have seen a, a, a leak of what is thought to be the color scheme, which is not like it a lot. that maroon style uh, color that we've seen on the training kits. And then after the training kits kind of came out, People wondered if that was maybe a false, uh, if like the, if it was actually a leak of what the training kits were going to look like, but if, yeah, I like that color scheme that they've got um, apparently reportedly for the third kit. So we'll see. We'll see. Good talk. I wanted to make sure we just covered that because we, it it was, we, we could have talked about it last week, but um, yeah, just glad we kind of discussed and feel free for the, uh, our listeners to, you know, let us know their thoughts about it too. Um, I can say that that reveal is coming soon as our most teams. Uh reveals coming soon as well um you guys had questions though that were not kits related joe patrick we even had an email question yes. for the first time in five strike final history sam went and dropped our email and in in, i think on reddit was it yeah someone on yeah. reddit was like i can't respond to them i'm not well, on twitter 
which I, like, would, God bless you. I would encourage everybody, if you ever want to send us a message, please email us, uh, five stripe final at gmail.com. <laughs> um, we love reading your emails. We had one from Andrew. I'll just read it. It was, uh, this is an abbreviated version. I will just say, Andrew, thanks for all the kind words you had for us. Um, very much appreciated. And I've kind of just shortened this down. He says, with the stock market being in the news, I thought this could be a good time for us to pick up a couple players whose stock we'd want to buy, sell, or short at the end of the season. Not long-term futures, just for this coming year. So for example, he says, I think I'm buying Brooks Lennon stock this year. Definitely okay. undervalued after a bad team last year, but I thought showed some bright spots. Uh, this upcoming season, there's some massive potential upside for having a Gressel-like player uh, or having a Gressel-like year with improved surrounding players. Uh, alternatively, he'd say to short, he would put, he would have, he would short Joseph uh, as comparing him to like a blue chip stock with crazy high expectations. Um, so this is fun. <laughs> I, I love this question. I'm trying to process everything I learned about shorts two weeks ago. I, I know, I right? I forgot, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like the, uh, yeah, we crammed for the test and now this is it. So, um, <laughs> My buy is probably mm -hmm. going to be pretty obvious if you've been paying attention to me at all on, on Twitter these last few days. I'm buying Eric Lopez. This is my short. I immediately <laughs> thought this is my short. <laughs> I'm buying Eric Lopez based on one game I've seen him play with my own eyes in which he kind of like did one cool assisty type thing. <laughs> no, I don't know. Like, I, I honestly, I just uh, remember him playing well. And I, I, the thing I remember of Eric Lopez in that game was just him being more like technical in tight spaces than I, for whatever reason, imagined him being when I, when I had initially seen the highlight packages when he was signed. Since then, I've gone back and rewatched some of those highlight packages and realized that he is uh, just a more technical player than for whatever reason I remember. For whatever reason, I remember seeing on those highlight packages lots of him just kind of running beyond the line, which he definitely do, does quite a bit. Um, but I just think he's a player that's kind of ready to break out. When you look at his pedigree, he comes from one of the top clubs in Paraguay. He played uh, his last year there. He, he started every match in which he played. He, I think they, he played 15 of the 22 games in the 2019 Clausura, uh, the Clausura, which his team won the title. So, um, and I think that, you know, with him having not played in most of – pretty much all of 2020 uh, competitive matches. I wonder if that could uh, reap some benefits for him in 2021, just in terms of him being settled there. It's not like he's a, a 20 year old kid or 19 year old kid coming and just moving here and settling down as he's trying to get the season started. He's got his, he's got his living arrangements set. He knows his teammates because he's been training with them every day. So I just think he's a player that's primed to break out. Um, do you have any off the top of your head? And then we can talk about who we're shorting. Well, I want to go ahead and talk about who my short is because it's Eric Lopez. Oh, well, yeah, go ahead. So <laughs> my, my idea with the short is that like you had the GameStop one where people were, were buying low and then it would go high and they'd sell it off and make their money back, et cetera, et cetera. Ah. Um, I, I'm, buying, I'm buying in to the Lopez early here and buying a lot of stock. And it's Joe See, Patrick's probably- This is like a real machine. day trading type of move. Like you're, you're like <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. I was like trying it. to keep in the spirit with it, right? Uh, yeah. which, as Joe Patrick's propaganda machine is what I'm calling it, pushes for <laughs> Lopez to take over. And I'm going to talk about the, the propaganda machine uh, at the end of the show. <laughs> as the starting player in every position for any United, from, from my understanding. Um yeah, no, I think I can get on the ground floor here and just kind of if I had to take a risk on it, he may turn out to be a really influential piece. I'm interested to see if he can fit into a spot out wide because my cell is, is still Jurgen Dam, who I'm still not convinced is great at soccer. Um, so, yeah, and I had some of the comments at DSS kind of yelling at me about that and like, dude, go look, go look at the stats. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Um, so that's my cell. I'm going to buy, though. I'm going to buy George Bellow. I, I, we talked about this before, and I just think he, he fits in a good spot for um, for Einze's system. I think he's in a good spot for Atlanta. I think this is a year where you could take a big jump, and I think that's that's easy money. So I see, I see Bellows, his stock is already starting to rise, sure. but maybe he's got some uh, top-line resistance from the performance uh, of the team. <laughs> Okay. To use as many uh, financial terms again, uh -huh. but yeah. So you think he's going to continue to just skyrocket? I think if you're if you're right, if that buy call on on George Bellow is right, I think that we're probably looking at him being sold for. Yeah, this is his uh, last year. If it is quite a bit of money, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, going to be in that very similar vein to other fullbacks that have gone to to Europe. Uh, you look at uh, people like uh, Reggie Cannon and uh, Brian Reynolds and, and others who have gone up uh to europe and done well because that's that seems to be a mold that people in europe are very interested in that dynamic fullback yeah um, george is obviously someone who can get forward yeah uh, my cell is jürgen dam and it's not that i hate jürgen dam in fact when <laughs> 
in fact, uh, you know, last year he actually proved a lot to me. I actually, oh, absolutely. I thought he, you know, proved himself to be a reliable MLS player. I just think that, um, you know, just the way that people are talking online when I see like uh, starting 11s kind of being designed on Twitter and things like that. Uh, he's in every single one of them. And that, I'm not saying that he wouldn't, you know, if you were hy- theoretically to make the Atlanta's best 11 right now, he wouldn't be in that conversation. But I just think that over time, I think he's a guy who is probably susceptible to injuries. We all, we saw him have a couple injuries just in half a season last year because he's like a sprinter type, you know, those mm-hmm. are prone to like, you know, blown out a hammy or something like that. So I think that that's a risk for him. And I think that, you know, just with uh, yeah, he's so reliant on speed, if something like that does happen, that could hamper that in any way could really affect him. So um, and I would see Eric Lopez as the guy who kind of supplants him somehow. But yeah. Yeah. I still think I still think that Atlanta might be in the market for a winger. Uh, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, on that. Uh, obviously, center back's the priority. But I think if a winger comes through and that might be a summer move as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we could see someone come in. Uh, it's going to be really interesting, but I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. That's right there with it. you. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Great question, Andrew. More email good. questions with lots of thought and care put into them. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Uh, we'll move on to some others. These are on Twitter. Um, I don't know what y'all are doing on there. That's that's not, that's not a place for, <laughs> for young eyes. Anyway, uh, Christian uh, asks, with Escobar now a legend of past at Lena Gloria and Mesa half out the door, who have you heard maybe coming in at center back for us? And that's a, a good question because honestly, it seemed like they were, were pretty, pretty much in on the uh, the kid from yeah not River Dave, Plate, Hector uh, David Martinez David Mar- Martinez, David Martinez. Yeah. that's yeah. just DC and Defensia or whatever it was. There aren't really any yeah, rumors out there right now that I know yeah, of, at least of uh of center backs. Um, one of our Dirty South soccer writers, Greg Outer, had a good shout the other day for uh, Tim Ream as being a guy who could be in the conversation of, of names. I mean, he would be a guy who definitely fits, especially if Atlanta United is looking for a left-sided center back. Um, Tim Ream is left-footed and has played on that side. He has not. He's not played for Fulham this year, so could definitely be a guy who kind of in the Emerson Hyndman mold, who's like looking for a move back stateside to potentially boost his value back up, or even just to just finish out his career in mm-hmm. MLS, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad move. Um, but there are obviously tons of hurdles in terms of the bureaucracy of MLS that could get in the way of that. All this to say, not really m- much <laughs> noise, n- not really much noise on these center backs. And that's why we're watching, I'm watching Fernando Meza to kind of see how that move progresses, because I feel like they cannot mm-hmm. let him go until there's somebody locked down coming in so if not yeah no, probably good that's probably a good canary in the coal mine for for the move right if mates ago goes there's almost definitely something lined up and it kind of feeds into jeff's next question who was asking about if we were looking to drop big money on a center back and the indication seems to be yes the yeah i mean clearly yes. the club was prepared to do that i mean mm-hmm. and i would consider three and a half million big money so Exactly. Yeah, I think they definitely are. Uh, I think that it's a position that's vitally important for a team that wants to play like in the Bielsa mold. You know, you want you yep. have to have kind of those players in the back who are super comfortable with the ball at their feet. That's why Tata Martino wouldn't play Miles Robinson, even though I'm no Miles Robinson <laughs> thought he would, he was capable of being a starter on those teams. Mm-hmm. But um, Tata was never, never sold on it. And so I think Gabriel Heinz is probably going to be the same way in that he's going to really want that position to be kind of like the top priority as of right now. Exactly. But there's, but there's other positions that need to be filled as well. You already mentioned the winger, but um, I definitely think they are willing to drop significant amounts of money on that center back position. They might be willing to do that to stir up the defense, which leads us to our next question about a key part of the defense, which is something I'm glad someone finally brought up because I didn't know if it was ever going to come up organically anytime soon without any games, but it's something I think we need to talk about. Steven asked, what is the end game with Goose's contract? Are we really trying to run out a 40 year old goalkeeper? And Steven, it would not only be a 40 year old goalkeeper, it's a 40 year old goalkeeper who's been trending downward for a while. Uh, if you look at his stats, if you go to American soccer analysis, check out the goalkeeper stats, Guzan is is very, very regularly at or near the bottom in most stats. Uh, you, we can talk about the reasons for that all we want, but but the indication is that even simply as a shot stopper, he's not on the level of a player who commands his kind of money is right now. And MLS goalkeepers are a luxury if you have a really good one more than anything. It's not a make or break thing. 
for the most part. But if you do have one that's well below the mean, that's a that's a detriment, especially if you're paying money. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I can't disagree with any of that. Um, I, I will just read out what um, Carlos Bocanegra was stated as saying when Brad Guzan stein, signed his contract extension that takes him through the 2023 season. He signed that almost a year ago today, actually February 10th of last year. Um, says, quote, Brad has been one of the top goalkeepers in MLS since joining our team in the summer of 2017, and we are pleased to agree with him on a long-term extension. Brad epitomizes the type of professional player we want at Atlanta United, and as a key member of the U.S. men's national team, we hope to see him represent our club at the 2022 World Cup. He's thoroughly deserved this extension, and we look forward to him anchoring our team for years to come. So what that statement says to me is a couple things. One, they like the fact that he's a U.S. uh, men's national team representative, and that gives, I think, that that the team sees that as a huge positive in terms of just getting the brand out there and those kinds of things. Uh, And I think that also what the statement kind of says or implies is that he's a key member of the team in terms of his voice in the locker room. I know Sam, you've seen that from just us covering the team. He's been one of the guys who's more, he's willing to speak his mind uh, when he, especially when he's upset, you know, and I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. that And I think fans appreciate it. um, Especially when things aren't going well, they, they don't want someone who's BSing them. Um, and I think that he's a guy who just, yeah, he has a lot of clout in the locker room. And I don't think that that's something that we should completely ignore. Although I would agree that the top priority should be kind of what they're providing on the field. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Maybe, I mean, I could definitely foresee him kind of like giving way, uh, over, you know, a two year period, or maybe even this year to like some other goalkeeper who performs better. But at that point, it does become very difficult to justify having a player so expensive, just solely being in the role of like locker room voice leader type, you know? Right. Especially. Uh, Yeah. He's probably, he's probably not going anywhere. That all being said, he's probably not going anywhere. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And I I don't think they restructure his contract or anything like that. Um, You know, it's, it's not a front office that seems like it would do that to, to a guy like he's in, who's, and you know, he's fine. Like it, he's not going to be hurt for money or anything like that. But I want to say one thing. I, I know people will disagree with this statement. I'm not concerned about him as a goalkeeper like this year. I'm more concerned about this contract, you know, next year and the years to follow as it winds right. down. Uh, but I know that the stats don't even favor me uh, in saying that I'm comfortable with them this year. But, you know, they what gives not. me ho- what, get, what kind of gives me comfort is the fact that this team won an MLS Cup with them in goal. So, mm-hmm. you know, I know, but I know the stats are kind of showing that a decline since then. But um, yeah. I'm not he, going to be the one who asks Brad Kuzan about it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, he almost assuredly is not worrying about stats um, and, and probably not too many other people. Harris Kruskic knows firsthand. Harris Kruskic knows firsthand. Firsthand. Don't, don't ask Brad about the Brad about the stats. Um, no, it's a, it's an interesting thing, but you bring up his, his presence and it will, I think that press conference he gave after, I think it was the Cincinnati game or maybe the Red Bulls game. The Red Bulls game. Uh, yeah. Back, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll be remembered Atlanta media for a long time as being the moment we knew that the death blow was probably coming. <laughs> it was very, very, very candid, very open. And, and we'll always appreciate that. And we'll always appreciate everything he does, um, working with the media and everything like that. And you get back to MLS cup. He made the most famous safe in that. Look, this isn't to, to bash Brad. It's just to kind of point out that the stats indicate that, um, you know, there, there there may potentially be better options out there in the future, and it may come to a point where we have to ask some serious questions. Uh, speaking of serious questions, Ryan McManus has a serious question. He says, Good segue. Thank you. I'm getting better at these. Um, <laughs> neither of our two most expensive signings in club history panned out particularly well. What does that mean for the next time we saw over $10 million for a transfer fee. And I want to start with the teams that have shelled out 10 million for a mm. transfer fee in the first place. Ready? There have been five players in MLS history who have been over a $10 million transfer fee. I'm going to include three more because they're actually on 9.9 million. They're close. They're sure. close. The first most expensive transfer in MLS history reportedly, Pity Martinez. Um, we're going to kill all that one, a, a, a fail for the most part. Next, 13.5 million, Secu Barco. <laughs> um, the next is is Brenner, uh, who just joined Cincinnati from Sao Paulo. What a coup for them, first off. But we don't know anything about him yet. We're hoping he does well. That's what they said about Pitti Martinez, too. Exactly. Like Marco, so. Exactly. Um, same thing with Rodolfo Pizarro, who went from Monterey to Miami for $12 million. 
Um, Brian Rodriguez never quite really panned out at yeah. 1.5 million for LAFC. Wow, I didn't realize and, they paid that much for him. Yeah, no, crazy, right? Yeah. Um, he, he just got shipped off to the well, be good too. Whatever, I don't know how it's Segundo League. I don't know how you say it. Um, the next is okay, okay, Pizuelo, 9.9, okay, solid. Um, and then Brian Fernandez at 9.9 million. He uh, didn't make it through the, the season. Yes. Um, and then Alan Polito, who was hurt a whole bunch, Chicharito. <laughs> um, oops. And then Matias Pellegrini, also Miami. That is not a good list. That is not. That's that is a not a list, list you want to be on. <laughs> that is, which is incredible. It's fascinating, it's super, though. It's super interesting. Um, so the answer to, to your question is uh, you have to assume that the money comes good most of the time, right? But the indications in MLS so far have not been that, which is so, so very, very interesting. I mean, I don't know why, I don't know how, um, but the, I think the short answer is yes, you trust it. The long answer is this is weird. Yeah. You know, I think there's an understandable in my mind, um, kind of, uh, there's a connection made between the money you spend and it's like how certain you're going to be that that player is going to be good. I was just having this conversation uh, yesterday on the radio talking about the Braves and like I was talking with the host and the host was arguing that the Braves have to go out and sign a right-handed reliever for the bullpen to solidify the bullpen and they got to spend the five million and if they're not spending the five million then you know that's a management's got to you know you got to blame the front office all that stuff and I, I was trying to make the point that spending five million might make you feel better it might make you feel more secure that you're getting a good pitcher but you don't know you don't you don't know what your return is going to be um, and it's really a kind of a flawed way to think about what kind of performance you're going to get in return for the money you spend. It's not like the more money you spend, the better the return is going to be. Um, there, there are tons of reasons why transfer values end up where they, where they end up being. But I think going back to Ryan's question, I think that, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, like you could, if you shell out more than $10 million, then you're, I don't know, I guess I would, my natural reaction would say that, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't really matter how much you pay for a guy, um, though you would expect a player to be better. But um, I think that what, based on that list that you just read off, I think MLS teams would be smart to kind of, kind of uh, find a range, a, comf- a, a range that they can spend in that makes sense for like the risk reward. None of that, I don't know if any of that made sense, but it reminds <sighs> like Tottenham for a long time, uh, me as a Tottenham fan, like they never went out and spent top dollar for the best players but they had this range of like 15 million to 25 million that they'd spend in and when they hit on those players it would be like a huge profit for them and if they missed on those players it wasn't like crushing to the organization you know it's not like they had to go out and do a selling spree so I think that there's a kind of a range there that might be a good fit for not just Atlanta United but a lot of MLS teams you can preach caution like that and I get it, but there's always going to be a general rule in sports that the team that spends the most is probably going to win the most. That's it's true. just kind of how it works. It's just kind of how it works. And you, you kind of look at recruiting and college football and things like that. You have like five stars coming in. It's the, it's the team that's going to have the most five stars is probably going to win. That's just how it works. It's just how it goes. So I don't know. Like I, I get where you're coming from. There probably should be some temperance and there is always something to be said for playing money ball and using analytics and things like that. Um, but, but don't get discouraged if your team is spending, don't, don't get discouraged, you know, especially for, a for team sure. United, Definitely. The, the owner, you know, is, is well within his means to keep doing such a thing. You know, I didn't hear all of your response there because I was, you were getting a book. To, I was pulling a book out. I'm going to show it to you. It's called the uh, pay as you play. I would recommend it to, anybody um it's a little bit out of date now i think it was written in uh when was it 2010 so it's a little bit out of date prices have changed and things like that but to your point the main point that it makes is the more money you spend the better your chances are of winning the league and it breaks it down like in tables and stuff it's it's kind of nerdy, but probably would be an interesting read. I've been meaning to drop it off at Teoto Football's house because he lives right <laughs> there. Uh-huh. So sorry about that. Of course, of course. Um, so there you go. That, that's that's a long answer to a to a pretty simple question, which is yes, trust it, trust it, trust it, trust it, um, as much as you can. Anyway, uh, last question here for the main question segment comes from Christian, who asked, "Do you think the FO uses the one time opportunity to buy out Heinemann's contract and get a player that delivers more bang for the buck, or do you think we can move him?" And Joe, 
go ahead and explain the the one time opportunity to to people. Go ahead. Appar- apparently, this I don't know that much about it. I've actually asked this question specifically to Rob Usri, who is like the uh, yeah. who's the all knower of MLS things. And yeah, apparently you, you do have like an amnesty clause. NBA has something similar where it's like you have like you can buy out one player's contract for any given period of time. I think in the NBA it's 10 years. I don't know what exactly it is in, the M- in MLS, but it does appear that there would be an opportunity for Atlanta to do that. As to whether they would do it, of course, the freeing up the money would be huge, but it doesn't seem to me like they are planning on that it. Yeah, yeah it seems like they're going about their business and just you know they'll roll with Heinemann if Heinemann's contract doesn't prevent them from doing any of these important things like getting in a good center back and these types of things I don't see why you would like rush to do it necessarily it's something yep. that, that seems to me like you pull the trigger on like when you're just in a corner and you gotta kind of free up some space any way you can so and and if you know and this is all assumes that Heinemann would be the guy that they do that on yeah, that they that they use that amnesty on. We just talked about Brad Guzan, you know, going late into his career uh, at a pretty steep price. You just you don't know, you know. Um, and maybe Hyman turns around or something this year. I don't know, but uh, I would say that no, overall, um, that they wouldn't. They're not necessarily planning on using that in the immediate future. Yeah, it's a very good point. I think Atlanta has used that once before, though. Am I right in saying that? Do, do I remember? them using that maybe once maybe this was another player we were like man I ho- oh was it chris mccann mm, i don't know i'd have to go been. back and look. look it up later look it up later um but it was a similar contract situation where the player just wasn't producing um to that level i'm um, gonna again I, I think it was chris mccann we'll look it up later and then maybe possibly edit it i do see atlanta united waves chris mccann um it doesn't specify like any kind of mechanism they used to wave him it just said that they waved him that was february 9th 2019 so not All that right. was not an end of year move interesting oh that is interesting you might that be it was right. like that yeah, huh. yeah yeah so yeah like again if they if, i think you're spot on joe if they come up and, and Heinemann is in the way that could be potentially an option really could be but it, i don't know my, my gut tells me if they haven't done it yet they won't do it yeah we'll have to find out so much stuff to wait and see here this is great This is great. But fortunately, folks, you don't have to wait for our brand new segment. Rapid fire starting now. Joe, Ryan McManus asked, do you plan on changing your podcast name to five string final to match the new kit? No, no, we don't. Nope. No. No. Uh, Free speech Taurus asked, Ibarra, Sosa, Moreno, Barco, and Heinemann, who starts and where? My thought. So Barra, Sosa, Moreno is your midfield. Switch them out how you want. Just put Moreno up top. Yeah, I think Moreno's got to start like at your your highest up, uh, and if that's the case, because he likes to take players on, is it very aggressive in his take ons? I don't think you can play Barco with Central Moreno. League, no. Yeah, mm-hmm. and which is something I've been seeing. It might it would probably work very well in FIFA. I don't think it works well in real life. <laughs> good take, good take. Uh, speaking of good takes, Michael asks, "Give me your hottest 2021 Atlanta United take." I like the kit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, uh, wow, see, that's I don't know. Scalding. <laughs> scalding. My hottest 2021 Atlanta United take is that they will score less goals per game than any other non Frank DeBoer firing year team. Ooh, so like, that's, that's, that's a good like, a, was it like four out of five years? Like, this will be the fourth worst lowest scoring team. That's my take. They'll still win more. They'll still win more. Um, Christian ask any idea how many Garber bucks we have. We're spending them like monopoly money. I think we're pretty good. I think we're fine. No one knows. Literally no one knows. We yeah, no one knows. No one even knows. if, even if you're tracking these things, you could track all the transfers and how much money they're bringing in. And you still wouldn't know. You still wouldn't you know, know because you don't know the schedule, the way that the, the money comes in. So yeah, it's almost impossible. It's kind of like a fruitless task of even trying to track it. The best way to track, see how much money uh, Atlanta United would have is all based on the rumors and like who they're signing. That kind of gives you an idea of how much they have to spend. All right, Free Speech Taurus ask, what will Rosetta, Rosetta's role be? Utility bench player, and I think, yeah, that's about right. He's a depth piece at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he's a depth piece. Spell Spelling players, I don't think he's a starter on this team. Joe, describe yeah, perfect... but he could work himself into that role. Beautiful. Joe, describe your perfect Sunday. Um, Rapid fire. Uh, back porch, beers, outdoor TV, watching sports. 
lovely, lovely. And that was on. Rapid. It's got to be like sunny, cool, a it little bit of a breeze. Uh huh. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. All right, Joe, any final thoughts before we get out of here? I do have one final thought, and I'm going to try to be as quick as possible, but it's a, kind of a deep thought. I don't want what we say or what I say uh, specifically to like be come the like the consensus thought just because like we say it or like I think that it's true I, I say this because it kind of hit me when we're we've been talking about Eric Lopez mainly on Twitter and I've been uh, as you said the Joe Patrick uh propaganda machine has been in full effect <laughs> um that doesn't necessarily mean that like anybody has to agree with me and it kind of hit me like Rob put up a, a a quiz on Twitter saying like who will have more goals and assists Lissandra Lopez or Eric Lopez and it was you know overwhelmingly Eric Lopez and I don't think that that was because of me I think that that's the right answer and for for legit reasons but I just want to make sure that everybody kind of feels like you know however they feel about whether it's a kid or a player or whatever like I just think it's great that we all have um you know our different feelings on things and I don't want like what we say on this podcast to become like the gospel uh thing that has to be accepted by everybody that's all I'm trying to say I do (laughs) <laughs> what are we doing here? What are we, what are we doing here if not for power and influence? <laughs> uh, I will say it is, I, I do enjoy when people kind of latch on to things that like I saw when the Rometty trade went down. Everyone was like, oh man, the thick filter. And I, I hadn't thought about that bit in years. That is fun. We're still yeah. kind of latching on to it. And it was kind of cool to, to know. I was like, oh, hey, I tweeted that once and it took off. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, y'all are lovely. Uh, we have big things in the works for y'all coming up soon. Uh, keep an eye out for that. I think the start date we're looking at right now, Joe Patrick, is March 1st. March 1st. March 1st. We're going to have some big things coming your way. Uh, got some big people coming your way. Got some fun stuff in the works, I think. Whole new era. Whole new era for Atlanta United. Whole new era for the five stripe final. So exactly. I'm exactly. I, to it. I can't wait. Uh, I think along with the new intro and everything like that, we're really kind of pushing towards making this a regular thing for y'all. Y'all's responses to, to what we do has been incredible. And we appreciate y'all caring at all what we may have to say for whatever reason uh, we really do. And hopefully things get picked up back a little more and uh, we're, we're ready to roll by the time the season starts before that we'll have some big things coming to you. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. All right. Sorry to Nathan Lane. We didn't have time to bring him in today. Uh, We're going to get him on the show at some point, but that's all we have. Bye, y'all.